Oral history and fossil evidence shows that in ancient times a colourful native lorikeet lived on most of the southern Cook Islands and on nearby Rumatara in the Austral Islands. However, in the last 200 years, since around 1800, it has persisted on Rumatara alone. The Austral Islands of French Polynesia and the southern group of the Cook Islands form an island chain of more than 2,000 kilometres. The islands of the chain have a closely related biodiversity and share several unique species. Long hunted out of the existence for its beautiful feathers in the Cook Islands, the lorikeet survived in Rimatara because of the protection of Queen Tamaiva around 1900. The Tahitians called it Ura for its bright red colour. The Queen placed a tapu or prohibition on the bird so it would no longer be hunted. Today, because it is so rare, it is listed as endangered on the Red List of Threatened Species and it is protected under the International CITES Convention and by government legislation in French Polynesia. Fifteen years ago, the Cook Islands Natural Heritage Trust staff, Gerald McCormick and Judith Kunsley, travelled to Rimatara to study the bird and its habitat. So my first experience of Rimatara was when Judith and I landed here in 1992, and we landed down here in this passage in a little rubber dinghy, and we came ashore to be met by the gendarme. We had very little idea of how many birds there were, but we set out to survey the bird, work out how many there were, and work out their distribution. And it was during that visit that we conceived the idea that maybe we could reintroduce them to an area in the Cook Islands if we had a suitable island. The greatest threat to the Ura nowadays is the ship rat, Rattus Rattus. Fortunately, Gerald and Jerth found no evidence of ship rat, so for now the birds were safe. So the, the reason for this project is essentially rats. And this is not the rat that we're concerned about, but this shows the threat to Rimatara though. Rimatara has the Pacific rat, which is a small, mainly vegetarian rat, which is not a problem to the lorikeet and to other small birds. It also has though, already introduced, since the missionaries would have come here, the Norway rat, this one here. Sometimes people call us the brown rat, but this is the big lumbering rat that you find in rubbish dumps and in cities and so on, on the lowland of many islands. But it shows that modern rats can come to this island. And so what we're concerned about is the rat smaller than this, the tree climbing rat, the black rat or ship rat. And that's the rat that we're really worried will come and destroy this population. But what if ship rats arrive hidden in cargo or swam ashore from the ship? The rats would multiply very quickly and before long they would be climbing the trees to eat ura eggs and hatchlings. Because the Rumatala lorikeet had previously existed throughout the southern cooks, Gerald had proposed that it could do so again, if there was an island free of ship rats. Ship rats were on most islands, but in 1994, a survey on Archer showed the absence of ship rat, and overnight, it became the island most suitable for a reintroduction program. After more than a decade of planning and complex negotiations, Gerald is on his way to Tahiti and then on to Rimutara to complete his mission of capturing 27 lorikeets to translocate to Archu. As on his last two trips, another queen is travelling with Gerald, the queen of Archu, Romamatane Ariki. The next morning, 
Joe meets up with his team in Papete for breakfast. They are from the San Diego Zoo, expert lorry catchers and handlers, and an expert on bird diseases. Finally, the team is off to the Matara. After an hour and a half on the plane, the team arrives in Rimatara, 600 kilometers southwest of Tahiti. The opening of the newly constructed airport a year ago was an important development for the translocation program. Work will commence in earnest tomorrow, but before that, the team has time to pay their respects to Queen Tamaiva, honouring her protection of the lorikeet 200 years ago, and seeking her blessing on the present program. An isolated house near the beach is chosen for the birdhouse. Before any birds are caught, the cages have to be assembled. Queen Rongomatane lends a hand as the last of the 11 cages are given the final touches. At last, everything is ready. The team finalized their plans. What they were saying, we got picked up at the airport, taken up this road, and then down this way, and we're now here. So here's the church. The big church is right there. Here's where we are in the birdhouse. James and Ridge. right down here. And up here is where the, uh, the first set of mist nets is going up. Long mist nets are set up on the hilltop where the lorikeets have been seen feeding on the flower of the utu tree. The nets are raised on tall bamboo poles. They are difficult for the birds to see and when they fly into them, they fall safely into the horizontal pockets. We're, we're making the net secure for the night so that other things don't get caught in it. So it has to be high enough off the ground so that pigs and horses don't walk into it, but it must be closed so that during the night birds like the brown noddy don't fly into it. First light finds the team opening the nets to catch the early birds. They wait patiently, willing the birds into the net. The waiting continues. It's now noon and the team have yet to catch a lorikeet. At last, at 1 p.m., the first ura flies into the net.
The ura is thoroughly checked by Albert to ensure the bird is free from all netting. The first lorikeet is in the bag and heading for the birdhouse. A new day brings new ideas. A second team is organized to set nets in the lowland banana groves. They basically this move pays off with we'll three more birds in the bag. Given a bit of time, they'll work their way through a couple of bags of the net. Okay, we got him out. It's off the wings, it's off the body. Now, I'm putting him into Ringer's grip because he's going to let go. He feels free of the net, so he's letting go with his feet. And it's now just over his head, so we've just got to work those loops over the head and he's out. So, there we go. What's that? Adult? Or near adult. He's coming out of molt. He's got molting feathers on the head. There we go. The Hilltop team continued its success with two more birds. So we've been here three days so far. We opened a site a couple of days ago up on the very top of the island and we got uh, three birds that night. It was great going by Albia and his group. Then the next night we opened up another site down in the Bananas and they got three that night and Albia got two upstairs. So as of the present time we've got eight birds. So if we keep going at this rate we should be on for all birds for the first flight, which will be a great relief. With the great success of the two teams, it looks like the quota of 27 lorikeets will be met. Over, and he's out. Okay, well this one's come from the banana plantation. Uh, we've had a very quiet morning and this is the second one we've caught in 10 minutes. Um, they seem to be coming down. Nice and easy to get out. He just, he just popped, in the, popped into the pocket and was lying there. Just one loop over the head holding him in. Um, that's what we like to see. My fingers get a rest this time. And we're on a roll. They're a challenge, aren't they? Alan and Bruce from the San Diego Zoo monitor the birds around the clock. They even sleep at the birdhouse. And that little guy there, schmutz. He's got the schmutz factor there. So I don't see any netting on him. It's Alan's job to feed the lorikeets. So we start with a, uh, a powder that's been manufactured specifically for Lori's and it's got everything in it. It's one-stop shopping. It's got uh, all the vitamins, minerals, proteins, and carbohydrates that the Lori's need and we're going to make up a mix that will give us enough for all the birds we have right now. So you can see this is a do this twice a day. So this is a lot of Lori mix. But I brought 12 pounds no actually 24 pounds, 12 kilos of mix. So Unless we were keeping an elephant, I think we're going to be okay. Okay, so we're going to go do the birds. So follow me and we'll check them out. Okay, so here's the, uh, here's the lorry room. First thing good keeper always does is close the door behind him. Because as good as we are, you never know a bird's going to slide out the door and you're not looking. So we're going to put this up here. So this uh, bird here was just captured this morning. This is Sunday, the 15th of uh, April. And you can see he almost uh, finished his cup of lorry mix, which is really good for a newly captured bird. You'll notice all these cages have the bird's band. This one is black band, black band, black band left. In other words, we put two bands on the left leg, red, right. 
and it was captured on 415. And we mark the time or the day they're captured so we know which are the oldest birds that we have here and which ones are the newer ones because uh, we really do want to watch and make sure that the newly captured birds start eating within a day because uh, being, being nectar feeders, they don't, they don't last too long unless they're feeding and we'll make sure they're getting the care they need. You can see some of these birds are uh, calm enough that they, as soon as I put my hand, take my hand out of their cage, they're already eating the new nectar. You can notice their tongue. The lorry family, the Lorinae, which is a subfamily of the parrot family, um, are called brush tongue lorries or brush tongue parrots because the tips of their tongue have little papillae that actually act like uh, little sponges. So when they stick their tongue into the nectar, it picks up the liquid and brings it back into their mouth. It's really quite a good system for, for feeding. On the sixth day, Two pairs are caught, so the team had 28 birds, one over the quota. So one bird is released near where it was captured. Straight enough for 60 grams. You let them take their own pace or you'll gag them. I think that's plenty. Okay, set up on there and see if we catch it in the wind and maybe it'll fly away. Ed Rarotonga contributed two flights to the project, one to bring the team and Rimatara guests to Achu, and this one for Gerald and the lorikeets. The day before the birds depart for Achu, a plaque to commemorate the occasion is unveiled by the mayor of Rimatara and Rongomatane Ariki. Dawn is breaking as the crew load the Ura cages onto the back of a truck. Two aircraft are the first international flights to Rimatara. Immigration, customs and quarantine officials have been flown in from Tahiti for the occasion. Gerald can finally relax, knowing the mission is nearly complete. The Queen of Archer and her grandson look forward to returning home. As the Air Rarotonga plane passes over Maria Atoll, we say farewell to French Polynesia. After an hour and 40 minutes, the island of Archu comes into view. This will be the Uda's new home.
Joe and his lower kids arrived safe and sound, and a huge crowd was turned out. The team and visiting dignitaries are given a traditional welcome to the island. A plaque is also unveiled in Achu to complement the one in Rimatara. Amidst great excitement, the Rimatara lark kids are transported to the release area where a bigger crowd has gathered. One by one, the Ura are given a meal of nectar before flying off to explore their new home. Queen Tamava were here today, she would be pleased to know her little lorikeets are still in good hands. This is a wonderful moment for everyone, especially for Judith and Gerald, who have devoted so much time to this project.